We have been preaching through this three-week series. And if you're new this morning, we first went through uh, week number one, which talked about why we exist. This, this whole series is about why we exist as a church. What is our purpose as the Source Church? And our whole mission is to empower people to impact the community for God's kingdom. That's why we exist. We want to empower people to make an impact in the community for God's kingdom. And so why do we gather together in worship on Sunday mornings? Wouldn't it be better just to say, you know what, we're just going out to the community? Well, we realize that we need to give an opportunity for people to surrender their lives to Jesus. So when we show up here, we talked about in week number one, we give an opportunity for people to transition from relying on culture to relying on God, to surrendering their lives to Jesus and making the Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life, which is why I take the time at the end of the message, even when we're running a little bit over, to make an altar call because at any time I realize somebody here might get touched by the Holy Spirit and want to surrender their life to Jesus. They might have gone off track and they might want to be coming back because the Holy Spirit is pulling them back and they come to their senses and realize that they need Jesus or they need to repent. And it's an opportunity and it's a posture of worship when we surrender our lives to Jesus. So that's why we gather together on Sunday mornings. Last week, I talked about the power of community. What does it mean to be in community? Why does the church get together in community? And we get together not just on Sunday mornings in community, but individually through the week in people's homes. We join power groups, and it's so vital to be part of that because people are praying for you, because people are reading scripture with you, because people support you. They celebrate with you when, they, when it's time to celebrate, and they mourn when it's time to mourn. Let me tell you, when people come in here on a Sunday morning, and I can see them in tears. And I can see their heartbreaking and shattering. There's no better place than to be in church on a Sunday morning when you're feeling that way and you put your hands on somebody and you pray over them because they experience the comfort and peace of the Holy Spirit that transcends understanding. We can't explain it. We can't explain the feelings that come over us. It's unexplainable, Paul says. It transcends all understanding, but there's something there. The feeling comes on, the peace comes on, it settles on you, and when somebody is praying on you in the Holy Spirit. So we need each other. We are better together, and as we talked about, we can do more together than we can apart or individually, which is what I want to talk about this morning as we transition, because Jesus says, you will do greater things than I can. And I'm like, Jesus, what do you mean when you said that? You'll, we'll do more than Jesus. Jesus died and resurrected from the dead. I'm pretty sure I won't do that except if Jesus had done it for me. Jesus did it first so I can have an afterlife, so I can resurrect, but I'm pretty sure that I am not going to be perfect. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to heal people walking around. Maybe God will work through me where I put my hands and he does that, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have as many healings as Jesus. You know, I mean, this is the son of God we're talking about. He taught perfectly. He healed perfectly. He could do whatever he wanted. And I'm like, how am I going to do more than that? How can you top Jesus? There's just no way. But what I think Jesus meant is when we're together, when we're together in community, Jesus was one person. Yes, he was God, but he was one person. And what he's saying is, I give you the power of my Holy Spirit. And when you get together in community and you start to move together and you start to synergize together and you get some momentum together, you will take off quicker and faster than my ministry ever would have. And that's what Jesus meant is we are better together. We can do more together than we can apart, which is what I want to talk about this morning is what does it mean to be on mission together. What does it mean to be on mission together? And I'd like you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, where we're, we're going to be reading verses 11 through 15. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 15. And this is where Jesus talks about the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church. Last week we talked about the purpose of the community. This week we're going to talk about the purpose of the church, our mission together. Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And here's what it says. It should be on your screens as well. So Christ himself 
gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here or there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And so just starting out, what I want to do is talk about an example. An example of when a child turns about one year old, what do we often do? We throw this big party. Now, I don't know about you, but my wife is Cuban. And Cubans throw big birthday parties for one years old. I was like, you know, I'm not so sure that the kid's going to really remember or realize it. But hey, so the, who's the party really for, right? It's for us, not for the child. But you know how the story goes. You get the bounce house. You throw a big party. You invite all the family. You bring all this food, right? You have this big magnificent party and then after feeding the kid cake and them running around and being bounced from person to person it's time to open gifts and the kid's already tired and already needs a nap right but you're going to do open gifts because people took the time to give the kid gifts now whether it's the first birthday or the first christmas and they have all these gifts what normally happens they go over here and they see the gift and you're like, here, here, here's a beautifully wrapped gift, has a bow and everything, and you want them to, and you sit there and try to teach them how to take the bow off, or you teach them how to unwrap the wrapping paper, right? You're trying to work with them a little bit, and what they do is they get about this way, and then you as a parent start to help them, so you want to open this up, and you start to slide this apart, and you're like, oh, look, look what's inside. Look, look at these cool things that they have. Oh, there's a cup. Look it, look it, here's the toy, here's the gift. And they're kind of like. And you're like, no, 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 here's the gift. You don't understand, here's the toy. And they're like, they, they want to play with the paper. They want to play with the confetti. They, they want to play with the box. They think this is so cool, right? You, you've been there, right? You, you know what I'm talking about, right? The, the box becomes so interesting and it's like, man, they're a year old. I could have just bought you a box. I could have gone to Walmart, got an empty box, wrapped it up with a dollar piece of paper, and you would have been just the most happy and content kid on this planet Earth because you weren't interested in the toy. They were interested in the box. You see, what I want to talk to you about this morning is because sometimes we, as believers, can be more interested in the box than the gift that God gives us or intends for us inside. We can, we can be more interested in the outside wrapping. We can be more interested in the confetti and the wrapping paper, and we can play with the box, but we miss the purpose of the gift. You see, as a church, we gather together we worry about the packaging, the music, the songs, the display, the lights. We worry about all these things that bring us comfort, but we can miss the purpose of what the church was meant to be from the very beginning because we're more interested in the wrapping paper than the gift that God has for us inside. Amen? If, I, I don't know if I'm talking to anybody this morning, but sometimes as a church, we can miss a purpose. What is the purpose of the church? What is what God intended from the very beginning? And it has to do more than just gathering together in worship. There's a deeper meaning. There's a deeper gift. And so the purpose of the church, I want to tell you, number one, if you're going to write not this down, take notes. This is how, so you remember it. Take that source pen. Take that handout. Write some notes. And number one is to equip you to serve. It's to equip you to serve. Our mission is to empower you to make an impact in your community. It's to equip you to serve. Look what Ephesians 4 says in the very beginning at verse 11. It says, so Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to what? To what? To what? To equip. 
To equip who? The people. Well, who's the people? It's you. It's everybody. Exactly. So a lot of times we get in this mentality, well, pastor, you're up there speaking. It's your ministry. You do it. It's your job. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the pastor or the leaders are like coaches on a team. They're not actually the players. The pastor's the one making the calls. He's the one guiding people, leading them, coaching them, teaching them. But he's not the player on the actual field. He might be one of the players if he's the quarterback making the calls. But you can't be the quarterback, and you can't be the receiver, and you can't be the tailback, and you can't be the lineman all in one. Amen? You can't do it all by yourself. So the mission of the church is to equip the people, to equip you to be able to serve and to be able to find out what your gifts are. So what we're, our hope is after this message that maybe if you've been a spectator in the stands, you got the coach, you got the players on the fields, and then you get the spectators on the stands. And our goal would be maybe for you to transition yourself from being a spectator where you just watch, where you just attend, to saying, you know what? I want to become a player. I want down on that field. I want to do something. I know God has given me some gifts and he's given me some abilities. And let me tell you, God has given all of us gifts. You see, here's the thing. Paul says, I want you to be equipped in order for you to grow. Did you see that in Ephesians? He says, your job is to equip them, pastors, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. That means for them to be able to grow. First, numerically, grow as a body, but also spiritually, so that the body may grow up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become what? Mature mature and i want you to think of it like this if you got a child a child needs to be served right an infant they need to be fed they need to be bottle fed they need to be changed they need to be served if they don't they cry because they're communicating to you i'm not happy because i can't do this for myself i can't change myself i can't bottle feed myself i can't eat by myself i need you they need to be served but an adult is the one who serves. A parent is the one who serves. And so infants want to be served where adults make the decision to serve. And this is what Paul's saying. He's writing to the church and he's saying, I'm seeing a lot of infants here who are looking for, they're walking around like they're adults. They look like adults, but they're still being bottle fed because they want to be served. And it's good to want to come to receive. That's a good thing. But we receive in order to be released. We receive in order to imp impact somebody else. We receive in order for, to bless somebody else. God, bless me so I can be a blessing on somebody else. That's our goal. It's like a sponge, a sponge that just absorbs water and sits. What does it do? It begins to stink, right? It gets moldy. It gets mildewy. You throw it out. You wash it. But a sponge that is constantly filled up with water and the water's released and it's filled up with water and the water's released that is a sponge that is actually functions and does its function by cleaning and washing it's the same thing with us god spills into us he fills us in order for us to release it and if we just absorb and we absorb and we absorb we become some stale stinky christians I'm sorry to tell you that. We do. We begin to stink. We just absorb everything and we don't spill out onto anybody else. And God says that we are to serve. Infants want to be served where adults make the decision to serve. It's all for number two. I want you to see this, to grow in your faith. God wants to grow you in your faith so that you become mature, adults, able to do the works that he has given you. He's equipped you for works you see, each one of us are being equipped in our life. Each one of you have a gift. I don't know if you know that, but the Bible says that each one of you have gifts. You have experiences in life. You have brokenness in life. And God can turn those miseries into ministries. 
Because when he heals you in your time of misery and you come out on the other side and then somebody else is experiencing the same thing, you now have the opportunity to minister into their life. And so he, he gives you and empowers you to do different things with the brokenness that you've experienced. But not just that, he gives you gifts. He gives you spiritual gifts. Look at what it says. It says that there, some are prophets, some are teachers, some are pastors. So it means that they all have different gifts. A pastor can be somebody who cares for somebody. They sit down and do they do some spiritual counseling with somebody. A teacher is somebody who stands up front and they teach to a large body and they're able to instruct and compose it in an understandable way. There's some people that overlap and they have a couple different gifts, but different people have different gifts and each person has been given a gift. If you look at 1 Peter 4.10, Look what it says. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And so he says, you all have different gifts. And what happens in the church is we often look at somebody else and we desire to want their gift. You got a better gift than I do. Can I have your gift? My gift is pretty easy for me to do. And so I want to do something more difficult or hard. I'd like to do what you do. And the reason it becomes easy to you is because it's a gift. That's why it's so easy. Look at the things that come easy to you. Look at the things that you're passionate about. But we're all exchanging gifts and we're looking at God and saying, I don't like my gift. I want their gift. And so what would happen in the church is the pastor would want to be the evangelist. The evangelist would want to be the teacher and the apostle. And look, at they all have different gifts. They're all different. We have a variety of different gifts. And so we need to look at if God has given me a gift when we gather together as a body it's not just about me receiving, okay? It's, it's not just about me receiving. In fact, church is not just about what you can receive. It's what you can give. You give of your time. You give of your treasure. You give of your gifts for the benefit of the body. It's so that the whole body can grow up. So people need you. They need your gifts, so some people come and they're like, you know what? I've been a Christian for a long time. You can be a Christian at home. I don't know if you know that. You can be a Christian in front of your TV. You can be a Christian on your phone and watching podcasts. You can watch podcasts of probably better speakers. You can watch TVs of better worship because they're a larger church. You can choose any church you want to be able to sit in your living room and to worship God. But you can't use your gift by yourself. This is the reason we gather together as a body of Jesus is to be able to use our gifts, for our gifts to spill out onto other people. So we don't just come to receive. We do come and we receive. We receive his word. We receive praise. But we come to utilize and use our gifts that God has given us. Amen? Your gifts are there to spill out onto others. So you should come to church with the mindset of not what you can receive, but of what you can offer. What can I give to God? God's done some things in my life. God's grown me. God's taught me some things. Who is it in here that needs me to spill out some of that love onto them? Who is it that needs me to spill out some of that teaching onto them? Who is it that needs me to pray over them because God's done some things in my life? We come to use our gifts. Here's something else, immature people want other people's gifts where mature people discover their own gifts immature people look at everybody else and they say i want that toy i want that gift i want that and they never appreciate the gifts that god has given them mature people say what is the god giving gifts that he's given me out of the experience i have out of the passions i have and let me develop that let me live into my strengths matthew 25 29 through 30 says for for to everyone who has been given more and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, into the outer place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, this is a story or a parable where, where Jesus talks and teaches his disciples about what it means to be a good steward of the possessions that you have. And he calls them talents, and talents back then was referred to as money, but I think we can use the same reference as gifts because God gives us money. He also gives us gifts and he also gives us time. 
And so we have to be good stewards of all these things. And he, get, he disperses it differently. He gives one servant ten talents. He gives another servant five talents and one servant one talent. And the one that he gave ten talents to went out and he multiplied it. He came back with 20. The one who he gave five multiplied it. He came back with 10. He did what he was supposed to do. He used the gifts and multiplied it. He made an impact on other people and brought more of a return. The one who was given one gift looked at the guy who was given 10, looked at the guy who was given five and said, this isn't fair. And he went off and he buried it because he was scared of his master. He didn't utilize his gift. He didn't use his gift. And when the master comes back, he says, why didn't you use your gift? Why would you bury it? Why wouldn't you even put it back in the bank in order for it to be received? And so what he does is he says, you know what? I'm taking the gift I've given you. I've taken, I'm taking the talent I've given you. I'm taking the thing you were supposed to steward and I'm giving it to the person who's using their gift and I'm going to take it away. And here's the point. If you don't use it, you will lose it. If you do not use the gift that God has given you, you will lose it. He will let somebody else have that opportunity. He will let have somebody else have that ministry. He will let somebody else experience the blessing of serving and sharing with other people. And you don't want to lose that opportunity because there's such a reward for you spiritually. It does something to your soul when you serve other people. And so if we don't use it, we will lose it. Number three, what I want you to see is the purpose of the church is to release you from ministry. So now we, we gather you together, we equip you, we build you up, you discover your gifts, and then we release you back into the community for you to do ministry. We don't hold you here. You can use your gift here at this church, and you can use your ministry out into the community. But you might say, all right, what is my gift? How do I serve? And you might ask that question, how do I become a servant. I love what Rick Warren says. He says, you measure a church strength not by its seating capacity, but by its sending capacity. Notice this. Churches often want to gather people together in one room and they want to keep them and they want to make them sometimes feel guilty or shame them for not attending on Sunday morning and beat them up. We're not about that. What we're about at the Source Church is we want to release people. We understand that God will move you from one place to another. We have people who have moved from this place up to Orlando. We have people that have moved to Germany. God moves them on. But we equip them while they are here because God is going to take them to another place, another destination, and put them in a situation where he wants to minister to somebody else, and we don't even know it. So we could try to gather everybody together. We could try to keep everybody together. You know, we could sit there and, and package this so pretty that everybody wants to play with the box, but they miss the purpose inside. It's not about how many people who attend. It's about how many people you can send. Amen? We want to be a church that raises up disciples to send them out to impact other people's lives. God said, I bless you to be a blessing to others. So you might ask this question, how do I become a servant? How do I become a servant? I have three analogies for you. Three analogies for you. I serve when I bring a lunch. I serve when I bring a lunch. What do I mean by that? You see, there's a story in the Bible of King David. And most people know King David from his battle with Goliath. And they say, I want to be like David. I want to go into the battle and I want a victory. I want to go into the battle and I want people to chant and sing my name. You see, the women love David. After he won Goliath, they were like, oh, David, it said, Saul, he slayed his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands, they were chanting his name. You know, I wish that honestly, you know, my prideful heart that I would come home one day and my wife would be in the, the driveway chanting, you know, Chris, Chris, you know, you've preached that sermon with all of your heart. Yay. And she's singing my name. You know, that doesn't happen. It hasn't happened yet. You know, everybody wants to be like David where everybody loves him and appreciates him and cares for him. But David, before he was a victor in battle, was a servant. You see, his dad didn't even recognize David as one of his sons when, when, when uh, they were going to elect the, the future king. 
and he was out in the field and he brought the, the oldest and the tallest and the best looking and the handsomest and all of these. And David, he was like a short little teenage boy. He was good looking, but he was a short little teenage boy. The dad had forgotten about him. And so the brothers are off at war. And they're with the, the Israelite army and they're getting taunted by Goliath. And the dad calls over David, who's out as a shepherd boy in the field. And he's like, here, boy, come here, come here. And he says, listen, before he even slayed that giant, what he tells him is, I want you to bring a lunch. I want you to go down and I want you to serve your brothers. And here's what it says in 1 Samuel 17. It says, now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers and their... And see how your brothers are doing and bring back some assurance from them. You see, his dad realized something. He says, you want to become a, a warrior one day? You want to fight in the army? You got to start by bringing a lunch. You got you to start from the very bottom. You got to start willing to do whatever gifts you have. You're the youngest person, David. You're small, but you can bring them a lunch. And when you bring them a lunch, what happens is when David goes with a heart of service saying that I'm willing to offer whatever I have, if I can bring them a lunch, I'm fine with that. And when he goes, God opens up an opportunity to raise him to a situation that he defeats Goliath and he ends up leading the whole Israelite army. He becomes king after Saul. He becomes the anointed because he was willing to serve at the very bottom. He was willing to bring a lunch and use whatever he had and God opens up an opportunity to do something great in his life. That's how God works. He takes us from the very bottom to the very top. He escalates us. He took Jesus and said, Jesus, you humble yourself and everybody will worship your name. You go to earth, you die, and everybody will bow their knees to you one day. They will worship, they will chant your name. That's how God works. He takes the very least of what we have and he escalates it to the very most and best opportunities. But we got to be willing to bring that lunch. We got to be willing to bring that lunch. We got to be do willing to do whatever. That means if, you know what, when I come into this theater and there's a big stain on the floor and it's dripping, I get the mop. I don't care I'm the pastor. I get the mop and I start sweeping and I start mopping and I start cleaning because we got to be willing to do the very least in order to be great and do the very most. Second thing is, not just to bring a lunch, but I serve when I offer a ride. I serve when I offer a ride. You can serve when you bring a lunch and you can serve when you offer a ride. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus rode into Jerusalem and a 553-year prophecy became reality because somebody was willing to offer a ride. You see, 553 years before Jesus, Zechariah had said that the Messiah is going to come through on a donkey. And you would think the king of the universe, God in the flesh, comes in on a white horse, comes in on a stallion, comes in with a parade of army and soldiers, but instead he fulfills a 553-year-old prophecy showing that he is God fulfilling the Old Testament and the leaders of the Old Testament and the prophets of the Old Testament by riding on a donkey. But first, somebody had to be willing to give up their donkey. In Luke 19, 31, it says, if anyone asks you why, tells his disciples to go into a town. They go down into the town and he says, listen, there's going to be a colt tied up. And when you untie that colt, I want you to bring it to me. And if anyone asks you why, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. And just by that sentence, the Lord needs it, they allowed for their donkey to be released for Jesus. They utilized what they had. Now, what's amazing is we don't know the individual who owned this donkey. We don't know if he owned 10 donkeys. We don't know if he owned 100 donkeys. We don't know his name. We don't know anything, but he was willing to give up a donkey, a donkey that was unridden, which means it was a very expensive donkey because it wasn't just like, you know, a Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, you know, that was coming through and he was going to ride him. No, this is one that had not been ridden yet. This was a young donkey. This was one that he would get top dollar for. This was like driving, uh, you know, upgrade from a BMW and, and, you know, and you're saying, here, I'm going to give this to you for free because the Lord needs it. 
So he was willing to utilize what God had given him, his possessions. He was willing to give somebody a ride. He was willing to let it go. And because he was willing to let it go, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament and showing the people that he is the Son of God. You want to learn how to serve? You bring a lunch because God's given you a lunch or you offer a ride to somebody because it's what you have, it's what he's given you, it's what you possess. You learn to give and utilize what God has given to you. The third story is you want to be a servant. You carry a towel. You can, you can be a servant when you bring a lunch. You can be a servant when you offer a ride to somebody. But learn to carry a towel. You want to impact somebody's life? Learn to pick up a towel. What do I mean by this? When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he's there at the, the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper that night, they're sitting there having the Passover feast and, and, they're, and, and they're enjoying each other's company and a fight breaks out amongst his disciples. And his disciples begin to argue, who is the greatest? Who is the number one? Who is what we call the goat, right? The greatest of all time. And people are arguing today whether Michael Jordan's the goat or LeBron James is the goat and who's better and they're arguing back and forth. The disciples were arguing which one of them is the goat? Which one of them does Jesus love more? In fact, John, I can just picture John. John's at the table and he's saying, Jesus loves me more. You know how we know this? Because if you read the book of John, the gospel of John, John referred to him as the one that Jesus loved. And so it's like you walking around to your siblings and say, I'm, I'm mom's favorite. Ha, ha, ha. I'm dad's proud and joy, what are you? You know, and they're fighting over this because John refers to him over and over in the Gospels. He is the disciple that Jesus loved. And I can just imagine that getting under Peter's skin because Peter was the one that walked on water. And so Peter getting on the boat and having confidence and walking on water, I can just imagine that, that this would have burned him. You know, and, and some of the other disciples are looking over at Peter and they're like, bro, you only walked three steps and you fell down, you know? And he's like, well, at least I got out of the boat. And they're, and they're arguing, who's the greater? Who's the greatest? Who's, who's the least? And, and they're like, man, some of you other disciples, their names aren't even mentioned. You aren't even going to be remembered, you know? I mean, they're fighting over this. And here's what Jesus does. When they're fighting over who is the greatest, and we know that Jesus is the greatest because he is the rabbi, he is the master, he gets up from the table, and he walks over, and he takes, out his, he takes off his outer cloak, and he picks up a towel, and he ties it around his waist. And he gets down on his hands and knees and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, to wash the disciples' feet was a common practice for a slave or a butler. Because what would happen is when people would come into your house, you would take their coat, you would offer them something like a drink, and you would wash their feet because they'd walk around in sandals and they'd walk these long days. And so it was a common thing. The host would tell the slave, take their coat and wash their feet. Or their servant, take their coat and wash their feet. So when Jesus gets up from the table and he begins to wash their feet, they're like, no, Jesus, you can't do that. You can't serve. You're supposed to be up here. You're supposed to be escalated. You can't do this. This is the work of a servant. This is the work of a slave. Jesus, we'll wash your feet. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. I love you so much that I want you to see that I can wash you from head to toe. But I need you to see something else. When you are arguing who is the greatest, I need to show you that the greatest is going to be great when they serve each other. The greatest is going to be great when he humbles himself to the lowest position and he's willing to wash other people's feet. Now you can imagine some feet are ugly. They're stinky. Some people don't want to have their feet touched. Some people go out and get pedicures because they don't like their feet. I had one person that in our family who just hates feet so I always make fun of them I take off my shoes and I'm always touching my feet on them I'm always you know feet are feet are kind of like ill gross you know because they're walking on them for so for Jesus to get down and wash somebody's feet what he's saying is I don't care how crummy your life is I don't care how crusty it is I don't care how disgusting it is I don't care how much you have cracks in those feet and you've broken those feet and those are some ugly feet you've done some ugly things in your life some 
brokenness in your life, but don't worry. I love you from head to toe, crust and all, brokenness and all, sickness and all. I care for you. I love you. And he humbles himself and he washes their feet. You see, Philippians 2 tells us this. Philippians 2, 8, 9 says, who, talking about Jesus, being in their nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So he didn't take advantage that he was God. He didn't take advantage that he is the mightiest, he is the creator, he is the redeemer, he is the restorer, he is the one who spins the orbits and planets into existence. He did not take credit for the power or position that he had. But instead, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus became the ultimate servant. If you want to be great in life, if you want to do something big for God, serve other people. Love other people. Make an impact on other people's lives. Make an impact on your own life by being filled spiritually, by joining a group. Make an impact on your kid's life by reading the Bible and doing devotions with them. But make an impact on the people's lives around you. You want to be doing something great? Be willing to do the least. Pick up a towel. Offer a ride. Bring a lunch. Whatever gift or ability that God has given to you, use it for his kingdom of God and he will multiply it and he will generously give to you and he will expand your impact and influence in the community. If you want to be great, become a servant. If you want to be great, utilize your gifts for the church and for others. I'm going to ask for you to bow your heads in prayer. Because there's one other passage that I want to take you to as we're praying. I don't need you to flip to it. I need you to listen. And I'll read it to you. Because there comes a point in everybody's life, the calling is for us to serve. But I don't want you to get fascinated with the outer parts of the box, the wrapping paper, and miss the purpose that God has for you. You see, there's a lot of people who attend church, but not everybody has given their lives to serve Jesus Christ. Not everybody has given their life to let Jesus be the Lord of their life, where they influence and they serve their community for him. And here's the scripture I want to read to you because at the end of your life, God's going to separate those who want to be goats, greatest of all time, and those who want to be sheep. And the sheep are the followers of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 25, it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, And all angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he's going to divide them. He's going to put the goats on one side and the sheep on the other. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king, who is Jesus, when he comes and returns, will say to those on his right, Come, You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you, the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see the hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? Then the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did invite me. You did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will look and answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger and needing clothes or sick or in person and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Decide right now. Are you a goat or a sheep? Are you great in your own eyes? Do you live life for only you? Have you let selfishness creep in and destroy and destruct the relationships around you? Do you look at everybody else and you say, I'm better than them? Do you offer what God has given you and utilizing to the best of your ability the gifts that you have? Or are you a sheep and you're saying, whatever I have, God, whatever you've put in my hands, whatever you've blessed me with, whatever you have put in my possession, whatever I'm a steward with, which includes your entire life because you've put in your life in your hands. You say, I offer it to you, God. You take my life. You give me whatever I have. I will use it and utilize it to the best of my ability for your kingdom. You are my leader, and I am your follower. Are you a goat on the left or a sheep on the right? And the amazing thing is, if you're a goat right now, you can walk across the line and become a sheep. Because a goat says, I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to live life for me. And a sheep says, Lord, I'm going to live life for you. You are my leader and I am your follower. So if you've never made that commitment to become a sheep where you say, God, he is my, my pastor. Jesus is my leader. He is my shepherd and I am his sheep following after him. You have the opportunity to do that this morning. If you'd like to do that, nobody is looking. Nobody is looking around this room. If you'd like to do that, would you just show it to God and raise your hand? Would you just put your hand up in the air and say, I want to become a sheep this morning. I want to become a follower of Jesus Christ for the first time. We want to pray for you. This prayer is specifically for you. All you do is have to repeat after me. There's nothing magical in his words, but Romans 10, 8, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, which means he's your leader, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you too shall be saved. It's a free gift that's offered to you. All you do is need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. So I'm just going to pray, and I ask you to pray with me. Father God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, and he paid the penalty for me. And I am committing to following after him and offering to him whatever I have for the rest of the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now again, there's nothing magical in that prayer, but if you prayed that prayer, we'd love to be able to walk with you as a church body. So you have a card, and on that, you can say, I committed myself to Jesus this morning, and we'll contact you, and we have a free book for you because we want to walk beside you as you grow in your new relationship with Jesus. And it says this morning that the angels are celebrating with you in heaven. There is a party. And so can we celebrate with one another? Let's give God the biggest round of applause for the people that raised their hand in here who accepted Jesus. We celebrate with you. And for the rest of us, there's an opportunity to get involved, to take those next steps. So as you leave this place, you'll see that ministry table. And these are just different opportunities that we give for you to utilize your gifts. If you don't know what your gift is, just sign up for something. Why? Because sometimes it's to bring a lunch. Sometimes it's to carry off for a ride. And sometimes it's to carry a towel. But whatever God has given you, just try something out and see yourself grow in that opportunity. Let's stand, let's sing, and let's respond to God this morning. <laughs>